Good evening and welcome to the Bangalore International Center for this program in collaboration with the Glasshouse Festival by Art Mantra. We are honored to have with us today two distinguished speakers in conversation, Professor Sonia Sanchez, who comes to us from Philadelphia, and Dr. John Bracey, who is in Amherst, Massachusetts. Professor Sanchez is an award-winning poet, playwright, professor, activist, and one of the foremost leaders of the Black Studies movement. Doing justice to her extraordinary life and accomplishments is beyond my scope in a few minutes, but uh, there are a few things I will try and touch on. She began teaching in 1965 and was a pioneer in developing Black Studies courses, including African-American women's literature. She began teaching at Temple University in 1977 and held the Laura Carnell Chair in English there until her retirement. Students I've met say that her classes were life-changing for them. In 2011, she became the first Poet Laureate of Philadelphia. She's the author of more than 20 books. Her poetry books include Morning Haiku and Homegirls and Hand Grenades, which won an American Book Award. Among her many honors are the Pennsylvania Governor's Award for Excellence in the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts Award, the Poetry Society of America's Robert Frost Medal, the Harper Lee Award, and the Robert Creeley Award. She is the subject of a documentary film, Bad Sonia Sanchez. Um, and when the mur mural arts program in the city of Philadelphia wanted to do a mural of her, Imagine a 30 foot high mural for all to see and remember you. She asked instead for the mural to be dedicated to peace with haiku poems contributed by various authors. And this really gives us a sense of who she is. Dr. John H. Bracey has taught at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst since 1972 and has been a cornerstone for students and faculty there building the fledgling Department of Afro-American Studies, a new field when he started. During the 1960s, Dr. Bracey was active in the civil rights struggle and other radical movements in Chicago, and he maintained those interests and commitments both on campus and in the wider world. His many publications include the prize-winning African-American Women and the Vote, 1837 to 1965, African American Mosaic, a documentary history from the slave trade to the 21st century with Manisha Sinha in 2004, and Black Nationalism in America. Our speakers have known each other, they tell me, for 50 years. And together with James Smethurst, they edited a groundbreaking anthology uh, titled SOS, Calling All Black People, a Black Arts Movement Reader, uh, which came out in 2014. Uh -huh. There is someone I'd like to mention for making yes. the evening happen, our common friend, uh, Sister Claire Carter, who together with Ingrid Askew put together the Middle Passage book, Tracing the History of Slavery in the Americas, which we all participated in and you were both on the board. So um, the talk today is titled Poetry and Politics from the Black Arts Movement to Black Lives Matter. And uh, it will trace some of the similarities and differences from the movements of the 60s, which they were both part of, to the present moment. Uh, Professor Sonia Sanchez will also read from her own work. So over to you, uh, Dr. Bracey. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a long topic. And I've got, what, about a half an hour to or 20 minutes to a half an hour. So I'll give you a summary in case I don't get to all of my minor points, but there are three basic kind of points I want to make before I turn it over to Sonia. Uh, well, I want to lay out the major kind of political and economic shifts that have taken place in the last 50 years that have re resulted from the decline of the Black Arts Movement to the rise of Black Lives Matter in the past uh, five years. Uh, Second, I want to look at what happens with poetry and, and the, the uh, evolution of, of poetry in its various forms and the rise of cultural responses that move in and out and around the poetry, such as the rise of uh, hip hop and rap, which take over the kind of popular world. 
And then I want to take a look at a little bit at, at the 21st century, the last you know, five or six years, where you have an intensification of repression that has resulted in the largest mass movement in the history of the country, which is ongoing as we, uh, as we speak. Uh, the essay I did in, in for Joanne Gavin in the Furious Flower, the last Furious Flower anthology, uh, came down to the end of the Black Arts Movement, and it came a little bit into the 21st century just to kind of uh, make the connection. So I wanna, uh, in that essay, I wasn't able to talk about the, the political and economic changes that I think are quite significant in where we, where we are today. Uh, by the mid 1970s, the civil rights movement uh, had been pretty much kind of stymied. Black arts was pretty much, uh, and black liberation were being uh, kind of contained and beaten back as the country moved uh, drastically to the, to the right. Uh, you have the influence of crack cocaine, you have the rise of mass incarceration, you have the uh, increased militarization of the police force to police black communities. Uh, you have at the same time, for those people who were lucky enough, you know, if you call it that, in, among African Americans, uh, to move out of those communities as a result of the population that got to go to colleges and universities as a result of the protests of the 1960s. So if you were lucky to get onto that, that kind of ladder uh, and get a scholarship on somewhere, get a degree somewhere, chances are you didn't return to your home community, you moved somewhere else. Uh, and so as the community was getting more and more uh, oppressed and, and pushed down upon, the leadership that used to live organically in that community had begun to disperse. Uh, and so the, the neighborhoods I grew up in, both in Chicago and in uh, Washington, D.C., no longer exist as enclaves where you had middle class black people living neck to neck and in the same environment as uh, uh, working class and poor black people. Uh, but in those days, we have what we call a national consciousness. Uh, you can kind of trace the shift in consciousness in the works of James Fady. James Fady is a pioneer, you know, died recently, is a pioneering uh, student of black culture. And his first book on hip hop is called Nation Conscious Rap. And he's talking about the rise of, of hip hop culture as a response to the oppression of the 1960s and, and the, the turning back of the 1970s. And he's calling for a nation conscious. This is a, a, a cultural formation that sees black people as a people and that sees black people as having to rise up and resist the ongoing oppression that was coming down upon them. So as early as 1977, you have the, uh, the, the message, which I taught in my class in 1977, which is an early uh, rap song that kind of lays out you know, what was going on in black community, the degradation, the drugs, you know, the confusion, the psychological damage, political damage, social damage. You have the rise of groups like uh, Public Enemy, and Rewrites Teachers and Arrested Development, who were still holding on to the legacy of the black arts movement, you know, the last poets and Sonia and Amiri and Ed Bullens, to see we are a people and we should be moving as a, as a people. At UMass, we taught the first hip hop class in the whole country in 1996. And I, I, my students ran it, and I got invited to give a talk every year, and I would tell them how I thought they should get themselves together and think broadly and so forth. And all they cared about was their city or their neighborhood. And they didn't, it never occurred to them that Motown didn't make records just for Detroit. Motown made music for black people around the whole country. I don't think they ever thought that they would only sell records in Detroit because they were from Motown. That's just where they were from, not what they were limited to. But the consciousness of the younger people was they wanted to get a buzz in Hartford, they wanted to get a buzz in New Haven, they wanted to get a buzz in New York, they wanted to get a buzz in Philly. And that was the limit of their, of their desire. They, they didn't see themselves as having a national impact. They didn't think a national impact was possible. And they had a kind of mistrust of things outside of their neighborhood. And this is a result of, of, you know, of a community that's, that's dominated by a drug culture, that's dominated by mass incorporation, that's dominated by police infiltration that, that fragments black people, uh, and the destruction of those institutions that black people uh, used to have to sustain themselves. Uh, you look at you know, black newspapers declining in circulation, uh, black businesses, despite the, the notion that they were getting stronger, in fact, were getting weaker. 
black banks were getting weaker because black people took their money from the black bank because now they could go to Bank of America and the uh, other national banks. And this was seen as progress in a certain sense, but it resulted in the destruction of black, black institutions. So the, a lot of the major institutions, the, the major kind of cultural things that, that sustained us in, in black, inst uh, black schools uh, disappeared. Uh, uh, one of the reasons for the rise of, of hip hop culture and sampling and all that, you know, uh, is in fact that they, there are no music classes in New York and there are no marching bands. You know, when I grew up, you learn to play an instrument in a marching band. And in the South, you still have people that play in marching bands. Where if you, if you cut music and marching band out of the New York schools, people don't learn how to play the saxophone. Where then do you get the sounds out of your head out into the larger world? Well, sampling is one way of doing that. You get the sound off of a, a vinyl record and you learn how to take that sound and use that rather than have a trumpet player play it, you get a trumpet sound and you add it to your music. So rather than just sit there and, and lament not having the, the same forms that we used to have, uh, hip hop culture arises out of the lack of, of material kind of wealth, the lack of material kind of excess, and making something pretty much out of nothing and then making that, that something, something that in fact takes over the whole world. Uh, what's important in that that carries us through the, the next uh, 20 years is that two things. One is if you look at poetry, again, there's a collection of younger poets who now are raised in the academy and are committed to the academy and are rewarded and uh, feeded and subsidized in the academy. At this, at this point, they're not, they don't have an obligation to get an audience just outside of the academy and, and, and a street audience. Uh, if you read a poem in 1965, 1966, 1967, your audience could be 2,000 people in an auditorium. It could be 500 people on a street corner. It could be somebody in a vacant lot. Uh, it could be in a bar. It could be wherever it was, there would be people that would be hollering at you if the poem wasn't on time. They would say like, break it down, make it real, make it plain. Uh, so you had, you had to hone your art in such a way that it had to meet the needs of your community and people around you who would call you out on it if they didn't like it. Right? Well, if you do a poem in, in, a, in a writing program or if you're writing in the academy, your audience is not the larger community. Your audience is your fellow students in the class or the, your audience will be primarily the people that will reward you for what you do and because and then you start to think in terms of what they do. So there's a, a generational shift in the poetry that develops a group that's a post-Black Arts Movement group uh, that came to kind of dominate in terms of numbers the, the production of, of African American poetry. But that left the field wide open to rap and hip hop, right? And so a lot of the impulse that came out of the Black Arts Movement, a lot of the impulse uh, it was carried on by, by the pioneers who, who, carried, who kept going on. And Sonia kept, didn't stop writing. Amiri didn't stop writing. Ed Bullen didn't stop writing. Uh, Eugene Redmond didn't stop writing. You know, Haki didn't stop writing. They are there. They're still there. But their influence, their mass influence now is slowing through the rise of hip hop in the rap community who see them, oh, in the last poets, can't forget the last poets, uh, who see them as the, their forebears. You know, they say, this is where we came from. You know, this is their impulse. And so when they begin to sample, when they begin to go back and look for models, when they, when they begin to develop this form they call spoken word, that's their take on how do you get a black arts consciousness out into the larger, out into the larger world. And they're successful because of the, the political and economic changes. What happens in the black community also at this time is deindustrialization. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, post-World War uh, II, you could drop out of high school and walk into an auto plant. You could walk out of high school, walk into the post office. You could walk out of high school and walk into any factory and get a job that paid good money, right? You didn't need a high school education. You just had to have a, a, a strong back and a, you know, a straight mind uh, and the willingness to do a boring, tedious kind of job, but it paid okay. And you got, you know, you got the weekends off, right? You could go, if that didn't work, you could always join the army, drop out of high school, join the military, drop out, join the military. Well, if you put in a high school degree requirement to join the military, that cuts off that, that exit. And black people don't just sit around and die. So again, they put all their cultural energy into a form that's their form, it becomes their form. And they talk about their lives and their form. So early hip hop is, is like they would say, it's a radio 
coming out of the black community telling people what's going on. So it can be, if things aren't good, then the, the language is rough, the, the images are rough, uh, the discussion is harsh, uh, the take on life is a, is a hard one. What makes it extremely popular and why it held on is that the same thing is happening in the broader society to the middle class and poor classes of white people. So you have an audience beyond a black community audience, you know, a black audience for hip hop. You have, in fact, a multiracial audience of people that say, this speaks to my condition also. It may be coming out of the Bronx, it might be coming out of South Philly, it may be coming out of New York, it might be coming out of you know, uh, Brooklyn, you know, it might be coming out of Atlanta. But what they're talking about talks about my life, you know, you know the alienation in my life, you know, the, the lack of a future in my life. And so hip hop lasts and holds on. And nobody thought it would last much. Uh, my favorite uh, art forms when I grew up, I grew up on bebop. Bebop lasted about 10 years. Uh, and when I was a teenager, I loved doo-wop. Doo-wop was, you know, a cappella music, you know, harmonizing. We all did that. A doo-wop lasted, what, five years. And then it got replaced by Motown. It got pushed aside. By the time I got to the academy, hip hop was you know 10 years old uh, and so you begin to notice that and you began to teach it so i began to teach it along with poetry starting in the mid 1970s by the time you get to the 1990s hip-hop is 20 years old and it's not going anywhere it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger you know so you you look around and you say okay who, who's doing this work who's telling us what it's all about and that's where you find you know brother spady uh, Spady's interviewing uh, hip hop people. He's talking to them. He's giving you their ideas, what they're thinking about. And he's trying to chronicle this movement as it's developing, right? And so when we taught the class, that was, that's what the class was all about. The class was about the consciousness in hip hop, uh, what it could do to stand in and, and work in concert with poets and musicians and in, other entertainers, actors, and so forth, uh, to, to move the, the race forward. Uh, so you get Chuck D's most uh, prominent song, Fight the Power, you know, Public Enemy. Chuck D said that that uh, sound never would have taken off if it hadn't been in Spike Lee's movie, Do the Right Thing. You know, so you have a confluence now of a, a new group of black filmmakers who are tied to these black artists, who are tied to the black musicians, that's driving black popular culture to the extent that in fact it takes over American culture. Uh, youth culture in the, in the 21st century in this country you know, and around the world for a certain extent, is African-American culture, it's black culture, it's hip hop culture. Uh, uh, James Spady's last book called The Global Cypher goes all around the world and you'll find all kinds of variants of hip hop in every continent. There's not a continent on this earth that does not have some variant of hip hop. You know, next to Palestinian hip hop, you have Israeli hip hop, you have Indian hip hop, you have very strong Japanese hip hop, you have Chinese hip hop, you have hip hop, in Cuba, you have hip hop in Colombia, everywhere. This is, this is an African American form that spoke to the changes in the world and that drove those changes forward. These movements by definition weren't political movements. They weren't talking about, you know, they talked about politics, but they weren't organized because they didn't like politics. They thought politics didn't make a lot of sense. And then you begin to notice, you know, the increase in militarization is resulting in the shooting of black people, you know, a, a increased brutalization of life in the black community, not only from the inside with the internal violence, but from the outside, you know, where in fact it became dangerous to be a black person. Like it used to be, well, if you were in your neighborhood, you were okay. You know, like I didn't worry about, you know, downtown, you may not be okay, but if I'm in, if I'm, I'm in the hood, like I can walk around and I'm pretty much kind of left alone. Uh, with the militarization of the police department, they are now in your neighborhood policing you and oppressing you in a space that you thought was your space. And this is what people begin to respond to. Uh, you know, and like Black Lives Matter comes up with, with, in response to Trayvon, uh, Trayvon Martin. You know, and they saying, look, this doesn't make any sense. This kid is not out of place. He's where he wants to be, where he belongs. And like, what is wrong with that, right? And if it's just Trayvon Martin, that's one thing. But you know that was a long time ago, you know, ten years ago. Uh, Black Lives Matter raised that issue, just like the NAACP raised the anti-lynching issue in the previous century. Can we, as Black people, walk through the world, just get out of our house in the morning, walk down the street, and come home without being murdered, without being worried about being murdered? You know, 
can I, you know, pull over in my car and, and take a nap on the side of the road without being shot? Uh, can I look in the trunk of my car without somebody thinking I'm stealing the car, right? Can I walk into a store with money and not be followed around by half the security people in the store? Or being asked that I buy what I just purchased and they saw me buy it and pay for it and walk out. So the, the, the pressure on black life is, is tremendous. It's tremendous. Uh, but it's also a pressure on young white people who also are trapped. You know, drug culture doesn't stop at the borders of the black community. Or people didn't quite get that point. That if drugs flow freely in the, in the black community, there's no line that says you can't also, you know, flow them over into the white community. And so there's an increasing drug culture, opioids and so forth now, among young alienated white people. So they are looking for answers in the culture and they're looking to black music. So you could become a billionaire in hip hop, not just because black people buy your, your CDs and, and do the streaming, but because you have this massive, massive white audience that gives you political power if you can mobilize it uh, to change the world, right? That is how, that is what's coming out of, and that's what's driving, you know, what we have before us, which is the largest mass movement in the history of the country. Uh, and it's different from what we did in the 1960s. Uh, There's not a lot of footage of what we did in the 1960s because we didn't let white reporters or white TV cameras into our meetings. So they couldn't, in fact, if they came in, you would put them out. Uh, this generation has grown up on social media. They've grown up, you know, uh, media savvy. They've grown up uh, with, a, with a phone in their hand. They can take a picture of something, you know, instantaneously and send it around the world instantaneously. They, they thrive on this, this digital world. And so they worship, they worship and use the media. So what you get then, not, when black people hit the street, white people come with them because they are, think they belong in that world and they are welcome in that world. Uh, if you go to a concert, you will have people of all races and colors at that concert. They're welcome in that world, nobody puts them out. Uh, it would have been very unusual to have a large body of white people at a black power rally. In fact, you would not want them at a black power rally. You would think they were impede, impeding in your space. You would not be trusting of them. Right? Black Lives Matter, when they hit the street, if you have 15 or 20, 30, 40 young black kids, they go immediately followed by 15, 20, 30 white kids with the same chance, wearing this, with the same slogans, with their fists up in the air, supporting black demand. They're not adding their demands to black demands. They are, they are being led by young black people, you know, supporting black demands, right? They understand, unlike previous white generations, that when black people move, everything moves, you know? And so if you look at the agenda of Black Lives Matter and the agenda of people in the street, they stop and pick up every issue that somebody brings up if you're out there in the street with them. So people will say, well, Black Lives Matter and, and Black trans people say, well, what about Black trans people? They say, well, come on, you with us too. They don't say, wait a minute, that's another issue. That would have been a 1960s way of dealing with that, right? Black women say, well, what about us? Well, they're at the front of the line. Right? You don't have to look for them, they're at the front of the line, right? And nobody would dare sit there and say, well, let the men go first, or that this is a fight that only men can lead. Uh, there, there's an acceptance of the, the complexity of Black people's lives, that we're not just one people, uh, you know, with one way of doing things. Uh, there's a demonstration that will have people from the islands, and nobody will make any kind of fuss about that. You, you know, you'll have a white lives young with a Lauren Hill, and nobody thinks that's unusual. Uh, you have uh, Spanish speaking, you know, brothers and sisters from, from uh, Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, you know, and Central America who bring their own version of hip hop, you know, reggaeton and so forth. And this is not seen as separate and apart from rap and hip hop culture. They're, they're at the same rallies, at the same demonstrations. And if you get those numbers, you have the numbers we have now of some, you know, minimum 15 million people, but some, some estimates have been 26 million people have been out in the street for the past two months. That is huge. The March on Washington had 250,000 people, and we thought that was really, really good. And if you had said, do it again next week, we couldn't have done it. Right? There's no way we could have done that. These young people are turning out these kind of numbers you know, over and over and over again, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people over and over and over again for the past month. And that's what's driving the world, uh, the world today. What does the culture have to do with this? Well, if you look and see where they're looking for their insights, where they're looking for 
the kind of cultural guidelines, the markers, the things that tell them where they are and where they want to go, they're looking again, the ports are back. So Sonia is as popular as she was 50 years ago uh, among younger people. Uh, when, when, I, when our uh, book came out, SOS, the, the major audience for it is younger people, uh, not, not, uh, uh, not the older, you know, kind of college set, you know, the people that are our generation. I think they already thought they knew most of it. The young people reading about what we did because they are moving now and they want to see how what we did relates to what they can do and how that could that can move them move them forward. Uh, one of the virtues of hip hop culture is in fact that it's a it comes out of the five percent adoption you know class thirteen x and all that. And one of the tenets is that you 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 venerate your elders, and you draw on the past you sample, right? So I got interested in hip hop immediately when my, my kids, you know, 30 years ago, told me to listen to some things. And I said, that's for Verde Flack I'm listening to. And it was, uh, you know, I think it was Lauryn Hill doing Killing Me Softly. And I said, like, I knew Roberta Flack. My mother thought Roberta Flack, why is she in this hip hop song? And they said, Dad, that's called a sample. And I said, okay, let me, let me listen. And so what you found out is that they're not rejecting the past, they're drawing from it and building on it. And the same is true with the poetry. So if you go to, you think to a hip hop or uh, uh, rap thing, you get deaf comedy jam, but what did they come up with? Deaf poetry jam. And they invite the people that they drew from to say, no, no, this is where we got this from. You know, they acknowledge the value of the elders. They don't put the elders on the shelf and leave them outside somewhere. They bring them into the current culture and their words are still there, their words are still used. Uh, they still sample Marvin Gaye, they still sample James Brown, they still sample Curtis Mayfield. Uh, they do their own take on it. You know, they'll reference, uh, you know, Sonia and Nikki Giovanni and Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison, uh, Alex Haley, you know, and the content of what their lyrics are. So it's a historical genre that allows them to move forward while not breaking totally with the past. And that, that gives them this kind of power that, that makes them, in a sense, broader and deeper than what we had before, because we had to fight past a kind of middle class kind of constriction in order to be ourselves. And you had to take off the coat and tie. Uh, you had to say, well, I'm not doing this anymore. And I said, I don't, I don't want to behave like you want me to behave. Like, I want to hang out a little bit. Like, you know, do I have to always speak proper? Why can't I speak the way I like to speak? But these kids assume that. That's already there. You know, and a big shift is that you got large numbers of the population of the country as a whole and a large number of people around the world who are fully prepared to listen to that come out of black people and follow that and identify that and agree with that. Uh, and that's where, that's kind of where we are today. And that's where things are different and more hopeful and also more dangerous than, uh, than they've been in the past. Segwaying into my colleague, the, yeah, Sonia back, I see you back again. Uh, one of the reasons that, that I like being around Sonia is that Sonia, Sonia has moved up, but she didn't leave down. You know, a lot of people go up and they say, well, I'm up here now, like so much for you all. Uh, Sonia is a political force because she's grounded, there you are, I see, grounded, grounded in, in, in the people that she came from and identifies with those people and cares about those people. It's not, it's not a phony care. Uh, and I'll just give one anecdote before I turn it over to Sonia. Walking with, when we worked on the book, Jim and I, we come to Sonia's house in Philadelphia. And Sonia would say, well, we're gonna go up to the grocery store, gonna pick up a few things and, you know, it won't take us but a half an hour. And I said, Jim, we're done. We're done for the afternoon. So we're talking about, I said, you've never been to the grocery store with Sonia. He said, it's only a couple of blocks up. I said, it doesn't matter. You watch and see, right? We walk out of the house, make the left turn up toward the supermarket. Everybody, everybody on the street knows Sonia. Sonia knows everybody. And it's not just nodding your head as they walk past, like, how you doing? And they keep moving. It's, how's your daughter doing? You know, uh, how's your son doing? You know, did he get that job? You know. Uh, how's he doing in college? You know, is he doing okay? Tell him, give me a call. And this is my number, right? It's, it's the, the people that, that are running the, the, uh, the beauty salon. You know, it's the guys in the dojo. You know, it's, it's the people in the Chinese place. You, you have a, if you can be an artist and maintain that connection with the community, right? And produce art 
they can win an award at the academic level, you know, at the Robert Frost level, at the National Book Award level, yet have people jump out of cars on the street and say, that's Sonia Sanchez. My wife loves your books. Can I, can I tell her that I saw you? Can I take a picture with you? That's the power of Sonia's art. Uh, there are very few African-American artists that have that. You know, there are a lot of famous African-American artists, but there's not a lot of them that stop traffic. Right? And it, they don't speak the language of the people in a way that speaks to what's inside of them and acknowledges what's, uh, what's inside of them. And it's not introspective like it's about me and my thoughts and what I feel. It's about what do you feel? What do we feel? Where is the pain in your life? Uh, and that's, that's the beauty to me of, of, of great art. You know, that's why I like Picasso's Guernica. It's about the bombing of a city. It's not a pretty painting, but it's a powerful painting you know, because it speaks to the horror of that time and lets you know people can come out of the horror of that time. So when Sonia reads a, a, a poem, like the poem about the young woman in the crack house, it's a painful poem. This is yeah, not a poem to say, it's like it you know, this is not a poem to say, wow, that was pretty good. It's not pretty good. This is a poem that, that grabs the insides of you and turns you upside down. and makes you think about, my God, what kind of world do we live in where this goes on? Like, that to me is what, what great art is. So I'm going to get out of the way and let the uh, segue over into to my buddy, the Port Laureate of the the Basie family, one of the, the great artists of, of the uh, 20th to now the 21st century, uh, who will pick up where I, where I left off and take it, take it as Sonia will do to a whole nother level. So now I'm gonna drop it off on Sonia. Go ahead. <laughs> 